kids start to see this, you see this, these candlelight vigils with speakers talking about these guys, testifying to their bravery and, and what happened, and uh, trying to get some sort of closure for their families. That's going to be a very powerful thing. That's an enormously powerful thing. You need to concentrate on that. So you should think about right here in New Boston, right in the gazebo, as you get into the fall season, that would be a great place. You could have something in Francistown, something in Garstown, and start that right across the country. Because even if that's big, it's isolated uh, on that the uh, state house steps. So great step that's going on all over the country. As you know, you don't see a lot of these things. So we took care of Stevie Foster, that's the vigil. You get back to school uh, Tuesday night from Agenda 21. And uh, the last thing is this common core thing that we have in our town here. We need to start to address this. Everybody needs to call a principal. We need to let him know that if you engage, if you allow this type of thing, they come into your school and you participate. You have no leadership qualities whatsoever. You're willing to do intellectual, moral, ethical, permanent damage to these kids. We'll call them up. An educational lobotomy on them. You have no leadership qualities. They need to be called out. Is that Agenda 21 you're talking about? That's tied. That's Chapter 26 on Agenda 21. But again, we won't get, I can't get into that now. But that, what that does is it's a copy of the largely Soviet system. Where they, 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 they'll take away most of the reading, they delete the first 200 years of American history. You create a lot of frustration in the child, and what happens is that will turn into a raw hatred to be directed off. That's why they have all the, the activist teaching contained within it. So it's, it's a horrendously dangerous thing. It's essentially the communization of the individual. I'm not going to get into that because it's going to be um, Jennifer's night to speak tonight. So, Common Core, that's big, and let's start calling these principles. And call the teachers out too. Ask why are we paying you guys if you're willing to engage in this. Don't tell me just because of your job. Because in the long run, guess what? They're going to have much of a job. They're going to hate you. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Yeah. <clears throat> One more brief announcement. This is going to be my last night as chairman up here. I don't think a lot of people already know that anyway. But I'm going to still be in this group. So um, whatever we do, we're just going to move forward. Because we've always got a good, <coughs> interesting group here that pulls in all kinds of speakers and all kinds of topics.
<laughs> so Patrick, I need you to come back in. The board would like to recognize Patrick Murphy and thank him for all his hard work and dedication to the Philosopher Club oh. Committee. <coughs> we would like to make him honorary chairman and um, we wouldn't be here without you. Well, I thank, thank you very you. much. Let's remember where it 
came from. Let's remember who voted for it, who was, off, who was in office when that happened. So, you know, when we look at uh, issues like Obamacare, where we know that the majority of New Hampshire voters, over 60% of folks in New Hampshire reject Obamacare, that tells us that we're probably uh, starting to crawl into the Democratic side as well. People, we've got to keep that message out there. We've got to keep educating folks. Uh, we can look at what the Senate has done. And Senator Sanborn is with us today. They get a chance to say hi to you, Andy. I'm glad you're here. Um, the Senate has been a firewall on what the Democrats have been trying to do this year. And they've done an excellent job. Thanks to the Republicans in the Senate, we actually got a good budget uh, out, of, out of what started at what could potentially have been a disaster. Thanks to what they did in the Senate, that education opportunity law was not overturned. And a lot of other great efforts that they tried to repeal the Senate preserved for us as well. They've also been, and, and Senator Sanford actually in particular has been involved in making sure that the people in New Hampshire know what Obamacare is all about and what it's going to do to them. So if we're going to win next year, we need everybody on the team. We need all of you to be part of this effort. You know, I, I often say when I go out and talk to Republicans is that I, I ask you just to take a moment tonight to remind yourself why you're Republican. Why, why do you come on a Thursday night uh, to, the, to the library to hang out with all these folks here? What is it all about for you? Because for me, it's an easy question to answer. I'm a Republican because I'm a mom. I understand that it's the principles of limited government, limited spending, limited taxation that lead to unlimited opportunity. And if I want to preserve for my children that America of unlimited opportunity that my parents fought so hard to raise me in, then this is the path we have to take. I understand what leaders we need to, the type of leaders that we need to see in office. We're going to, we've got a lot of exciting elections starting to take shape. We've got a lot of voices out there talking about maybe becoming Republican candidates. I think we're probably going to hear from a lot more before our field really, you know, strengthens. But at the state level, we're going to continue to push back. We're going to continue to talk about Senator Shaheen. We're going to continue to talk about Governor Hassan and the policies that she has promoted. We're going to continue to talk about uh, Representative Carol J. Porter and and McLean Custer and the work that they're doing down in, in Washington. And we're going to be as loud as we can, but we can't do it alone. We need you on board. We need you to continue what you're doing here in Boston. We need you to get involved in campaigns. We need you to reach out and help us. We, if you're not signed up for the on our website yet, if you're not getting uh, an email from NHGOP at least once a week, then we don't have your email. I urge you to go home to nhgop.org and sign up. That way, when we send out a message, you can help us push it on to everybody in your circle as well. We have a lot of great opportunities. We are going to win a lot of elections next year. But only if we all continue to work together and continue to kind of, you know, build the team that we've been working on all this time. I am happy to discuss anything you want. I could stand up here for three hours and talk about policy and party and building and structure and campaigns and everything else. But I want to make sure that I answer the questions that are important to you. So, um, Patrick, I thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I really hope that this can be an interactive conversation back and forth. So I, I invite you to, um, to tell me what it is you want to hear about tonight. Yes, sir, that was quick. What are the candidates in the next cycle of today? What, what issues should they hammer home? Obamacare, no question about no, it. No, at the state level. Oh, at the state level. I think it's all about budget. It's all about budget and Obamacare. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I think other people are you know, saying the same thing here. If Obamacare is going to hurt us in New Hampshire. Um, there's a new, a new site up in the RNC that we'll, we'll get you connected to through our website called ObamacareCost.org. I think is what it is. ObamacareCost.org. It is costing us jobs. Uh, everything that you hear on the national level about Obamacare, pushing work the workforce into part-time work, it's happening right here in New Hampshire right now. Uh, what we see in the, the uh, just the last couple of days, Anthem Blue Cross uh, just came out yesterday or the day before, I lost track at this point, uh, talking about the Medicaid expansion, the uh, exchanges, the healthcare exchanges. They are, anybody buying it, it go, going to, who is going to be pushed into the healthcare exchanges, buying an individual policy, has now lost about 25% of their choice. Uh, not, uh, ten, uh, I think, um, is it 16 out of 26? Uh, hospital, only 16 out of 26 uh, hospitals? Almost 50%. But, right, so it will be included. All hospitals are being shut out. Late tonight, they put two hospitals back. Oh, so, great. So, so a little bit of pressure goes a long way. Right. A little bit of pressure goes a long way. Right. Uh, so, so, so even at the state level, these are that's an issue that's going to be. And, and remember, it's folks in the state 
House who have the ability to say yes or no to the federal government. So that's going to be a state issue as well. But next to that, it's the budget. Thanks to the Republicans, we were able to save the budget. It's spending. It is, oh, think about the things, what are the issues that have a direct impact on the quality of your life? It's the money you earn and your ability to spend it to take care of your family. It's, those are always the issues that voters care about most. It seems like the New Hampshire advantage is getting diluted over time, and that seems like a good, uh, solid point for candidates. Would you agree? Yeah, no question about it. But what is the New Hampshire advantage all about? It's about our tax-free status. It's about living in a state where that has a limited and fiscally responsible government. You know, that's what that, the New Hampshire advantage has always been built on, and that's what our reputation as a state has been for decades. We have slowly lost that over the last maybe not a full 10 years, but certainly over the last six, seven, eight years. Um, and and I, I, am, I agree with those folks who say, if we don't put the brakes on now, when do we ever, when do we get it back? You know, when does it end? Uh, I think that's true at, at, for federal races and for state races. So, yes, oh, you, yes sir, you know you yeah, um, yeah. Speaking of budget, um, this is probably more on a federal level than it is on a state level. When are we going to hold these guys, or how can we hold their feet to the fire with not having a budget? Right. I mean, since Obama's been here, this is ridiculous. Yeah, how right. can we possibly, you know, go on? How, right. It affects us. It all trickles down, obviously, to the states, but yes. it starts way up there. And how, what can we do? Are there any business owners in here? Yeah, can you, when was, you know, when have you ever gone five years without a budget? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean yeah, any, 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 yeah. You know, heads of households in here. You don't, you don't, you don't get to do that. It's, it's extraordinary. Um, and, and unfortunately, when we, when we have the major, when they have the majority in the Senate the way that they do, obviously it's really hard to make, um, to make progress. But I, I'll say this a thousand times today. I will find a way to say it in my answer for every question you come up with. The most effective thing that you can do is talk to people you know. Whether it's in the parking lot at school, whether it's your coworkers at lunch, you know, at church, after services, there is no, no matter who our candidates are, no matter how aggressive I am coming out of the state party with press releases and messaging and everything else, your neighbors trust you. They know you. They do business with you. They see you at the post office. They live, you know, in the same town with you for 10 or 15 or 20 years. You are the best reference any candidate or any political message can have. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how we can force them in Washington. I think the president has very clearly chosen a, a policy, a strategy on, on this and, 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 and not for them a budget. It's part of his strategy. Uh, but if you want to change it, we, we have to have Republicans win. People say to me, how do we get rid of Obamacare? By electing Republicans. How do we get a budget? By electing Republicans. You know, how do we solve the problem we face with education? By electing Republicans. And the only way that's going to happen is if all of your neighbors turn out and vote Republican on election day. We need you to be our voice. Yes, sir. So that also has to happen across the country, right, right. for the Republicans. And that's a pretty big, uh, you know, it's a sizable task. Absolutely. What's the state party's position on nullification by state legislatures of bad federal laws, such as Obamacare? Because that's something I think we could use more aggressively. It doesn't sure. require a national referendum. Sure. I believe that our platform, platform um, has a plank in it that talks about states' rights. Um, I don't think that the party has an official position on nullification. I, what I do know is that um, I agree with you that it is our state elected representatives and senators who have the strongest voice and the greatest uh, you know, ability to kind of put the brakes on that. But I go back to what I just said a second ago. That doesn't happen if we don't elect Republicans. You know, the Democrats are kind of, you elect a, a Democrat state rep the next day, they're calling the federal representatives to find out how they can get more money from them. You know, they're practically asking, can you tie some strings to us, please? <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, so, so that, my best answer for you is get Republicans. Of, and, and you know what? I, I would also say, because that's, that's a good issue, that, it, it goes to a lot of other issues that I'm sure are important, you know, individual issues that are important to you. Make sure you're having these conversations with the candidates once we know who they are. Because Republican or Democrat, uh, you know, that's where it comes. That's where it comes from. You want to know who you're voting for. So, so the state legislature has the power to push back against the federal government. So it's, it, it doesn't seem like such a lost cause waiting for the entire country to come around. Oh, no question so about it. So if, if the 
states could put, or at least our state could put a little more pressure than that might federal state. Right? But you know, it's not just about pushing back against the federal government either. We have a strong state legislature that, you know, we're obviously responsible for our own policy here in New Hampshire. Um, you, you know, I want the whole, I want Republicans to win across the country. But I do, you know, have my moments where I think, God, if you just win in New Hampshire, I'll, I'll take it. You know, that's, that, that, that would be a good start. Um, and, and we're lucky here in New Hampshire. We have a lot of voice in the country. And it's not, it is because of our primary position, but it's not just during primaries. It's not just during presidential primaries. But what happens in New Hampshire is paid attention to across the country, as I think our former speaker probably uh, is familiar with, you know, and had a couple of good fights he took on. Uh, last time around, and what we were lucky he was successful with, and it got some attention. So, how are you? Good. Last time I saw you was a very depressing night. Uh, I saw you on election night. I remember that. <laughs> that I remember. I, I, I have something to say to you. I remember on. sitting alone in Jillian's at 10 o'clock yes. at night. I think that up pretty quick. Uh, yeah. Um, you touched on something that I want to comment on, and I want you to comment on my sure. comment. Um, Mitt Romney probably could have won if we had more unity. Absolutely. Uh, today, talking to a lot of people, I don't think Kelly Ayotte's going to be reelected because of the amnesty bill, so called, whatever, immigration bill. There's a lot of people very upset. How can we work on bringing the Republican bases, the, the conservative base, the more modern base, together? Because although Mitt Romney, by some, which I believe was totally wrong, considered a rhino, because it was really more, far more conservative than people realized, if they had not put that aside and said he's better than Obama, we wouldn't have Obama today. And this is what we're facing for our future. Is you touched on it, unity. When we come across our final candidates, we have got to get behind them. How are we going to do that this time? Sure. Uh, first of all, I, I don't think it's, you know, it's no big secret that we had a, a long and contentious primary, and um, there were some very strong and passionate feelings, I think, that are expressed during that primary. I want to tell you, I think it's, it's a good thing. I love that the Republican Party, both our platform and in practice as candidates and as activists, that we embrace a broad spectrum of we're the party. We're the party of debate. We are. We are the party of, of, of openness. We are the party of debate. We are the party of ideas. We are the party of innovation and, and of, of, of you know optimism of, of the future. Um, and I think, quite honestly, and I've said this many times, I think that unity is born out of respect. Uh, I think that when we we're going to have primaries, that's a good thing. Let's debate the ideas. Let's talk about the issues. Let's exchange ideas. Well, let's do it in a way that is respectful of each other. And do it in a way that when the, um, the next day after the election, you, we can still look at each other with some respect and some affection and shake hands and move on and do what's got to be done. I really have very little tolerance for the, if my guy doesn't win, I'm not voting. Or if my guy doesn't win, I'm going to the other side. Um, and, and I really, I try very hard to be understanding and to, and to listen and to hear it. But we are sitting here today living with the consequences of that attitude of that mentality. Now, i got to tell you, I would have voted for the Republican candidate in 2012 no matter which one of those Republicans won. No matter which one of them won across the entire spectrum, that person had my vote going into the general election. Because I know that Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid and Maggie Hassan and Carol Shea Porter and Emma Clay Custer are not good leaders for our country. They are, and Jean Shaheen, don't let me ever forget Jean Shaheen. Yeah. Let me just say again, Obamacare brought to you by Senator Well, fortunately, she doesn't do much. Um, so, well, she does an awful lot. She does it quietly. Yeah. She does it quietly. Right. Um, but, that, but that, if we're going to go into a general election with unity and respect, that means we have to conduct ourselves with unity and respect throughout the, throughout the primary. And the respect is the important part of it. We've already got a, 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 an interesting uh, group of potential candidates out there talking about running for higher office. And they already are the voices that represent a broad spectrum of Republican ideas. But every single one of them represents Republican ideas. And I'm going to vote for the Republican who gets the nomination. And I, I invite you generously and, and warmly to join me in doing that. So, I'm
I'm sorry? Nothing. No, that's good. Oh, one more point. Uh, I heard today that Jeff Bradley, who was going to run for a possible governorship, was dropped out because of his family. He did. He did. That's what he said two days ago. He, I, I think that you were right. I think that he was actually very Don't firmly, firmly plan, intending to run. And uh, he ended up learning over the long weekend about two illnesses in his family and decided it just wasn't that's too bad. fair to bring it on. It is too bad. He, I think he would have made a very strong candidate. So. He's pro abortion. So, you're absolutely. I, 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 first of all, I, I'm not sure that he would say it that way, but the, uh, I, I understand what you're talking about. But I, I will tell you again, I'm pro life. I'm a conservative. I understand that not all of my Republican candidates are. I'll take Jeb Bradley over Gene Shaheen or Jeb Bradley over Maggie Hassan every day of the week, and, and with a smile and enthusiasm. So. Um, again, let's have respectful primaries, debate the differences in our candidates, and then let's make sure we're behind them strong, strongly when the primaries are over. Yes, sir. My only confusion is that as a party, we do that, okay? So here's a person, and maybe they're not good on this issue or that issue or that issue. And then Republicans always seem to do that. They say, okay, well, we'll try to get behind this person. They won the, the primary and so forth. I don't see that in the Democrat Party. How come the Democrats don't run into that? Because they're zombies. They're, 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 you go there, and it, what was the last time you saw like a, 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 a pro-life Democrat win? Well, there are a couple Why? of others right now. Well, so you a couple of what? Listen, uh, you got to remember, we live in a, a different part of the country. There are a couple of pro-life Democrats serving in the U.S. House right now. Why are they not? They're there. But not they voting that way. They don't live in New England. They don't live in New England. Then they're not voting that way. So, well, I'm not sure how but, many... But, I mean, I'm not pro... I'm not one issue it. guy or another issue right. guy, but what I see is is that the the Democrats, you don't see Democrats that are, you know, these, these more conservative Democrats winning all the time. They just don't seem to have that problem. But for us, it's like, well, we have all these principles that we're, you know, and, and ideas that we have, mm -hmm. and then in order to get somebody elected, we're going to go over here to the middle of the road Right. And it's like, why do we have to do that? Why don't they have to do that? Well, I mean, I what's happening there? Is, is it a matter of leadership? Think, is it a matter no, of No, I, I, I don't think so. I think, I think often it's a matter of voters. I mean, who, who've got to be honest with themselves that it is a whole lot of people show up and cast ballots. And in New Hampshire, the majority of our elections are decided by independents. Now, as chairman of the Republican Party, I want strong, principled Republicans to win elections. And okay. I believe we can do that. I believe that they can. I believe that when we stand on our principles and when we can articulate them with some clarity and some passion, that we can win. I never once tried to separate from the fact that I was you know, pro-life when I campaigned for Congress. Um, I, and, I, and I think that voters very much respect sincerity and integrity above purity. So, I'm looking for, for so, purity, right. but at the same time, right. it's like that. Well, and it's you vote for somebody, and they're, they're, they're supposed to be doing this, and then they get into the job, sure. and all of a sudden they're, oh, well, let's take a look at gun control. Let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at that. And you're sitting well, there going, what well, we just happened? As long as you mentioned gun control, and you, and you mentioned our senator, Senator Ayo, a minute ago, I know there are a lot of folks out there who don't like the position that she has expressed on the immigration bill. But I'd like to remind those folks that she took a very principled position on the gun control bill. The second time. And, and she took, no, the first time. This, the, the, I disagree with you about that. If you talk about the vote for cloture, um, I agree with her when she says, if we can't debate gun control, then who are we as Republicans? If we can't stand up and have that debate and defend our position. Uh, you know, and, and let's compare her to, the alter, to, to her, her counterpart. On the other side, you know, Jean Shaheen, who has voted for every um, spending opportunity that she's had, and Jean Shaheen, who was the 60th vote on Obamacare, and Jean Shaheen, who signed a letter to the IRS saying, please look more closely at taxpayers and American citizens based on their political preferences. You know, Kelly Ayotte knew what was coming her way on the gun vote, and she did it because she believed it was the right thing to do. We might not agree with every vote she cast, but I know that when she casts a vote, it's because she believes it's the right thing to do. So, hey, hang on, it's others. Yes, sir. Uh, Jennifer, first off, thank you for all that you're doing. You've been a great representative of uh, the people here in New Hampshire. Thank you. Um, in, this, in going to the polls for our primary, I live in Francistown. Uh, I was, my wife and I were one of the first ones at the polls. Uh, as I 
I stood there waiting for her to get out of the ballot box and the couple of people that were before me were undeclared or independent registered voters. They show up at all the Democratic parties and all of their committee meetings and everything else. They all picked up a Republican ballot. Is, is, the, is the leadership in the state aware of how much that affects who we get as candidates? Well, we have an open primary, right? Right. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, there's and who will bring in Democrats? We're certainly aware of what the process is and what our primary, how our primary works and what the potential for influence is. And that's, you know, that's not something the party can change and it's not something, um, I'm not sure if it, it, it would have to be changed by the so legislature. We, had, we passed the bill in 2005 there you go. that would have uh, changed that. Yeah. And Senator Bragg imposed it in the Senate. Mm -hmm. So it didn't pass. So, uh, yeah. right. yeah. You used to have folks okay. You know, no, I, I would imagine that there would be a lot of people out there that would debate whether or not that's a good or bad thing. Uh, but I certainly, um, I, I hear you. <laughs> I mean, I, but but here, here, I'll tell you, my position on that is the same as my position when people say to me, the media is always undermining us, the media is never on our side. There are a lot of, a lot of influences out there that we cannot change. It is what it is. And our job is to overcome those challenges. Our job is to win elections in spite of that. So it, our job is to get out. There are a lot of independents out there um, who vote Republican. But more importantly, there are a lot of independents out there who don't vote. And we should be talking to them. If we cannot make the, make the argument why voting for smaller government, less intrusive government, less ta lower taxes, more control, responsible spending, if we can't make that argument to the voters, then with all you know, due respect, we don't deserve to win. That's an argument we should be able to make. Can I just suggest something that the party might want to look into as far as changing the state laws? And, and that might be that if, if an independent undeclared goes in and picks up a Republican ballot, that they at that time declare themselves as a Republican. So they don't go in and vote for, for the candidates that, that they want, general, generally liberal candidates on the Republican Party, and then walk out and say, I declare myself as an undeclared again, right. and then come in and pick up a Democrat, or, or come in and vote for a Democrat. I mean, they should have to stay at least registered as a Republican. Again, that well, was the party can't speaking. change it, it's legislative. Right. right. And try, yeah. It is, are there, is there any, are there other states that <laughs> have the, that allow undeclared, there are other states a allowed, a lot of them allow independents to vote in their primaries. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I just, um, I, I shared your frustration. I'm not convinced that that's the, that that's the most effective way to fix the problem. I think it's more effective to win them over. Like, they, you know, they should be voting for us. Uh, and, and statistically, when you look at polling in New Hampshire and across the country, folks who identify as being independent or undeclared lean to the right. They lean to the right of center. If we're not making the argument and winning them over, then we're, we're not doing something right. So we, you know, and we really have to take responsibility. I don't want to be the party that's always blaming somebody else for why, you know, for why we're not winning. We can win. We have, we stand on principle. We know who we are. We know the policies that are going to lift up our community and make it you know, better for everybody. We've got to get out there and make that argument. So. Yes, sir. I think part of the problem is that we are part of the principles and policies. Many principles, many policies, we don't always agree. The Democrats are a party of a policy, and that's the policy of controlling government. That's right. Yes. the policy of the state. And that's a very um, readily organizing philosophy. You know, we see it up in the House at all the time. On the budget that passed the House, you could tell the rank and file Democratic representatives did not want to vote for that budget. We got up, I got up and mocked them because they were voting for a budget that was a Republican budget, and still they were told to do it because they are the party of control and they understand it's not a budget, it's not a policy, it's right. it's controlling government. Right. And, and so that they they never get to the point where they really get upset that they're. Um, Electing somebody that's too conservative or too liberal because it doesn't make any difference to them right. as long as a Democrat. As long as a Democrat. We do. You know, we, we get upset about some of those people. But, it, but, but they, they, they vote, as long as they're a Democrat, they'll vote for the Democrat. Yeah, We've yeah. got, you know, we didn't do that in the general election. No, but but it's, it's asking us to be something that's not in our DNA. I know. We, in, our, in our DNA, there's a concern about um, policies, there's a concern about the traditions of America. All the issues that go into it. 
their, their concern is controlling the state yeah. and using the state to yeah. their view. Right. And, and I don't disagree with you. And it's got to be our job to overcome that somehow. Did you want to, was I cutting you off, right? No, I was just going to add on to what Bill said. They care about gaining control. Hey, number right. one, gaining control. And until we organize ourselves well enough to have that as our most important thing. But you know what, you're absolutely right that, and, and this I'm not suggesting we give up on principle. On no, but, but I think that you, I think it circles back to what we're saying, though, and Obamacare is the perfect example of it. Right. Obamacare is about gaining control. And if we want to win, we've got to be able to make the argument to the, to the people how it hurts them personally. Now, luckily, Obamacare has been massive enough and crushing enough that the people are feeling it and seeing it and understanding it on their own, and they're, and they're pushing back against it. Um, but we have to be able to articulate that message, not just me in front of you and not just our candidates in front of the audience, but every single one of you to your neighbors and your coworkers and your family and your friends. I, I you have to tell you, and I've admitted this only once or twice in, in my lifetime, but I have a 28-year-old daughter who voted for Barack Obama in 2008. <laughs> she did not vote for him in 2012. <laughs> Uh, let's know, hope she's setting a trend. There's, let's hope she's setting a trend. Now, now we've got to remember, Barack Obama is not going to be on the ticket in 2016. But his policies can be. And the damage that he's done can be. Let's make sure we're focusing, targeting on the message. But else, John? Jennifer, I don't think enough people, Republicans, understand that New Hampshire has a constitution. And the ones that understand it has a constitution have never read it. They don't understand it. I can tell you that a frequent recurrence to the fundamental principles of the Constitution and a constant adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, industry, frugality, and all the social virtues are indispensably necessary to preserve the blessings of liberty and good government. The people ought, therefore, to have a particular regard to all those principles and the choice of their officers and representatives, and they have a right to require of their lawgivers and magistrates an exact and constant observance of them in the formation and execution of the laws necessary for the good administration of government. Part 1, Article 38. If people understood what this little constitution meant, we wouldn't have to be worrying about Obamacare. We wouldn't have to be worrying about expanded Medicaid or Common Core or anything else. All this would be taken care of. The problem is that people are not educated on what the true rule book is that is set forth uh, to run this state. And we've made it right. an emotional state. Well, well, I have to say, when I hear you read that, in this day and age, what I hear that translated is vote Republican. Yeah. That's what that sounds like to me. A constant but, observance of the fundamental But John, principles. you make a good point. Most people don't even know we have a constitution in New Hampshire. Right. Most folks who uh, you know, don't know our, our federal constitution by heart, people are busy. They are burdened. They are weighed down. We need to elect representatives who are, have the passion for this right. that you display and that Bill displays and that um, Gary displays and Andy. You know, we need to continue to elect people that have the passion for that who will take those words and that passion and translate it into policy that are, is going to take the lives and improve the lives of everybody in our community. I say it all the time. When Republican principles are translated into policy, the entire community is lifted up, is lifted up. We all benefit, no matter who you are, or where you come from, or what you look like, or how you vote. When Republican principles are translated into policy, the entire community does better. It is, it, we have a moral obligation to spread the word, to share the principles, to make, do everything in our power to make sure that uh, leadership in Concord and Washington is returned to the Republican hands. Anybody, anybody else? Yes, I sir. have two questions because I'm new with this. One I'm thing, sort of new with it too, that's okay. <laughs> one of the things I noticed in the last election, and also now I'm ready to begin, is funding. Funding? Sure. Funding. If you I will write me a check before I leave, by the way. That's <laughs> <laughs> But um, yes. I noticed that, like, Shaheen went to New York, when she was supposed to be attending a very important vote. Picked up a lot of money. Mm -hmm. She should have. And a lot of people going to and, and that was a vote, by the way, where it mandated attendance by senators. That's right. And she was given permission to right. go raise money. Well, that concerns me because I really <clears throat> don't feel. Right. I mean, they come down to the local level of money. Right. <clears throat> well, that's the bribing their way to the well, this is It's very so it's difficult. Out of the town. The town will be hit. None of us want big taxes, but, and so they'll take the carrots, and then of course it goes away. Right. They, you're talking about two different things there, but yes, the funding of candidates and a lot of it is money that money. 
talk about this all the time when I was running for Congress. They do this very nice thing where they tax you until you can't breathe anymore. You send your money to, uh, down to Washington, and then they say, you know, I, I feel bad about it. Here, let me give you a couple of cents back. You know, and, 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 they're, and they hold it out like it's a yeah. gift to us somehow. Like somehow they're doing us a favor for giving us just a few pennies back on what we've sent down there. Uh, the reform of funding was guided by a little old lady here in New Hampshire. I bet got done, but I don't see that things have changed much. And it's ironic because when I came here, a lot of the public image of Republicans that you're very well healed. They do not. Well, I think that's it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's a, that's a nice bad public image. I wish they take a more populist, because historically, the Republican Party was a party of the people. Well, I agree with you, but, but I would say again that I think that we absolutely are the party of the people, and we need candidates who can articulate that. If you cannot articulate that when you vote for people who are going to fight to make more of your paycheck in your pocket at the end of the week. That's about the most populist message you could have. That's who we are. And if, and if our neighbors don't know that, then we have fallen down on the job. I don't think people are happy with the surveillance either. Right. And, you know, when you're looking for um, terrorists, can you really, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. The bigger the haystack, what do you increase your chances of finding right terrorists? Right. I understand. So you're right. I that there's been a lot of frustration expressed out. Again, I hope that you have these issue-oriented conversations with your candidates. That's the, these are the, those are the folks who have the you know potential to actually make a change in those areas. Yes, sir. I just have a like a philosophical question. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna I might use this on every candidate. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, so the Constitution says we have inalienable rights, right? certain inalienable rights, and it's the government's job to preserve those rights. Right? How do you define what is a right and what isn't a right? Well, I think that the Constitution has very clearly defined what our rights are. Okay. So, I'm, and so I, and a I cell think, phone. And I think that a cell, a cell, cell phone, phone is not a right. Okay, so why is it <laughs> Why is it right? Well, I, boy, I don't know if I want to get into this. This is a deep conversation. Yeah, it's important. It's but, important. But, but you know, look, you know, we have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Cell phones make me happy. So good for you. <laughs> you have a right to pursue yeah. one. Okay. You know, so I had listen. Um, I I agree with you. You know, I, I would love. I would like you to, to ask that question of every candidate and take every single one of their answers. Okay. I'd like to see the montage <laughs> uh, of those <laughs> answers. But you're thinking the right way, okay. and and I think what we what, one of the differences that that we see that's very clear and obvious between Republicans and Democrats when we're talking about limited government, we look at the Constitution and say it's very clear that government has this limited role, these limited responsibilities. So how do you define the boundary? Government does not have rights; people have rights. So how does your philosophy define that boundary? You have to. That's got to be a crisp. Right. Not some fuzzy thing, right? And, and if I ever run for public office again, I will have a crisp, clear, two sentence <laughs> answer ready for that one. That's a good answer. answer ready for that one. I like how you're thinking. I like how you're thinking. Yes, sir. I just might add that the Constitution's purpose is not to define the people's rights. That's right. It's to define the limits of government. Exactly. Sure. Well, the Bill of exactly. Rights is a sort of people. Right? It's, it's limits on the government to protect the people. Remember the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. You know, the Tenth Amendment yeah, says, sure. just because we didn't list rights in exactly. the Constitution doesn't mean that they don't exist. So how do you define right. what rights the government should protect? You know, is, it, is food a right? It's yeah. not about yeah. the right to eat. The government doesn't protect any of it. It just right. doesn't violate it. It just doesn't violate it. There you go. The government's job is to prevent injustice. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is justice. Okay. And the government's role is to prevent injustice. And when that happens, then they should then they should come out and help us. Other than that, they should stay out of our way. Okay. I, I think you, you arrived at the, the central point of the problem that we have in the country is that people are you know, largely detached from the knowledge uh, of the history of the country and not only that, the whole development of the law through, through centuries. Two centuries we had Jefferson, those guys who brought them in here that said, we're not geniuses, we're aware of the lineage. In, in major uh, events through history. That's, that's the problem. 
It's a huge problem. It's like John says, they get cut off from this. It's being used as a weapon against us. And it's like Bill says, these statists, they design everything to entrench themselves. And, and if you look on the educational side now, where in this community we focused on Common Core, we said they're going to bury us if we, don't, if we don't stop them. They want us totally devoid of any knowledge at all. So to me, that's an enormous issue right, right here. And how would you handle something like, like Common Core? I mean, it's... Well, again, I'm not a candidate for office. I, I reject Excuse Common Core. I think it's a bad idea. Um, you've mentioned it a couple of times now. Do you know about the event at St. A's on Common Core coming up later this month? Yes. Yes. Are you all aware of that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Anne Marie Banfield, if you don't know her, friend her on Facebook. She's one of the yeah. most knowledgeable and. Um, she's going to be here in November. Yeah, she's great on Common Core. Yeah. You know, I'm a big believer, and, and the Republican Party, and our platform is very clear on this, in local control of education. Mm -hmm. Parents, teachers, principals, and out from there. Local. We, you know, so I reject the idea of a national standard of any kind for education. But what's more important, especially in the position that I hold today, I'm here as chairman, is that our party rejects that. Our platform rejects that. So I have to tell you, I really enjoy this conversation. I enjoy the exchange of ideas. I like that. I, I'm so impressed at the level of um, understanding and passion and, and, and engagement that I can see in this room tonight. That's what we need. But you're the ones who are here. We need you to take it home with you. We need you to spread it. Um, I assume I, I assume that we have a time limit here at, at, of some sort. We can go till so. till nine. We can go for oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's fine. I just want to make sure that I wasn't the one who carried what this. We, what we tried to do so. in this group right here was to try to get people involved as activists on specific issues. And we mentioned the vigil and having the locals. So everybody spreads the word. And the Republican Party should, should, should very strongly identify with that and thank these people for what they truly are per community. And that can be a very, very powerful thing. Now, it's the same with Common Core. They can have all the debates that they want at St. A's, but I'm going to tell you something. If everybody in here that has a kid, they start calling this guy in town and saying, yes. you know what? We want to sit down with you because you are going to injure our children. And, and then the next principal in Francis Town, and the next one, you know what? Now you're going to start that ball right. rolling. And that's really, I think you need a weapon like that. I think you need to step it up in I mean, terms of the activism. There's nothing radical about that. that that's what America is all about. But it goes back to what I said at the beginning. You have the strongest voice and the strongest influence in your neighborhood, in your community, in your town. You're absolutely correct. If a bunch of parents in your school district got organized and started going in to sit with your superintendent or your principal day after day after day, yep. it has an influence. There's no question about it. I don't know how you vote on things in New Boston at that level, but when you let you know, make sure your local vote reflects your position on these things as well. Mm -hmm. The um, there's there, I, I know I said it already. You are the most uh, you are the most effective and influential. Uh, referral that any candidate or idea can have. The people in your community who live on your street, who go to school, you know, who send their kids to the same school you do, they know you, they respect you, you have friendships with them. That's how we spread the word. Look 
looking at the Democrats and saying, what's your plan? What's your plan? So, again, we have to be able to articulate that message. Yes, sir. Um, I just want to say, I don't think we want to see Medicare. You don't want to say Medicare at all? No. Okay. It's a social program. Again, it was started by the Democrats. Why do we want to save it? What is that? Well, I guess, that, and again, no, I embrace the faith. I, I, I appreciate the. I know I'm going to transition away from it. The majority of the people support well, it. Well, listen, if we have a plan that can transition us away from it in a way that right, continues to, to, so that. But what, what we but don't want. want but, but you know what? Here's, here's the problem. You need to have, if you're, if you're going to say we have to get rid of something, we've got to have an honest solution for the, for the problem that we face. And I assume that nobody in this room wants to see elderly people in their 70s and 80s literally living on the well, street. That sounds who like can't. Democrats would say. So, no, listen, you know what? Do you want, there are, there are real people in the world who have suffered from real problems and real challenges. Now, it is not the job of government to take care of everybody in the world who comes down the pipe. We understand that. And we also understand that there's good Republican policy that it will allow young people, especially, for example, Social Security, look at the solutions that Republicans offered so that young people would start investing in their own retirement uh, opportunities. So that, you know, there are solutions out there. If we want to win elections and return Republicans and conservatives to leadership, we cannot be a party that only criticizes and that only tells you what's wrong. We have to have solutions. We have to have alternatives. Yeah, well, going back to the, um, the unity thing. Um, the what? The unity. Unity thing? Yeah, I'm hearing a lot about The unity, unity thing. thing. Yeah. It's a big thing for me. I think yeah. it's really important. And unity is important, I think. But um, we have to remember unity is not like the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is our principles. And if we have to sacrifice our principles for unity, then we've lost the whole back. I appreciate what you're saying. And, and I, I have to say, um, last year, it was shortly after the election, I got this email from the Republican Party. And I think I would like to point out that shortly after the election, after the election, I was not chairman at that time. Everybody knows about to complain about it. It was from, from me. Like a national party, I think. Okay. But they basically did this research project where they said, why did we lose? Yes, growth and opportunity project. And the conclusion yep. of the paper is basically saying what they realized was the majority of the people in America today don't hold the same values as 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. That's why I lost. The majority of the well, people I, that voted chose Obama. So what they said was what we have to do is they were saying we have to reach out to Hispanics, we have to reach out to gays and lesbians. Basically what they were saying the scene, what the, the report was saying was reach out by basically compromising on immigration, compromising okay. on gay marriage. And to me, you've got to draw the line somewhere. Okay, yeah, yeah. it's my, it's my turn. Yeah. You <laughs> can't sacrifice. I, I read the Growth and Opportunity Project. It's 97 pages long. I read the entire thing. Nowhere in there did it say that we need to compromise our principles so that we can win elections. I don't know. I kind of, so, well, that's, that's what I kind of got. Well, I, 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 I have no doubt that you may have. It's not what it said. I read it, I, and, I, and I've worked closely with that document since becoming chairman uh, at, at the national level as well as at the state level. What it said was we did not reach the voters who decided this election. Now, there are a lot of, part, a lot of, parts in, a lot of states in our country where Hispanics decided the elections where other groups of voters decided the elections. And if you go back and look at the entire results from 2012, Republicans across the country lost everybody except middle-aged white guys. We lost everybody. So, we, they, uh, so that, that tells us that we are not talking, we, are not, we were not reaching, our message was not reaching the people who decided this election. Now that's not the same as saying, uh, we have to be in our principles and say and do whatever we have to do to get those people to vote for us. That's saying that, just like I've said six or seven times already tonight, we are not talking to people in a way, either where they are or how they, in a way that they can relate to and that they can listen to us. We do have to reach out to Hispanics. We do have to reach out to African Americans. We do have to reach out to every vote. As I just said a second ago, Republican principles when translated into policy lift up everybody. We've got to be reaching out to all of those voters and making that argument to them if we want to win. And as to what you said about principle is um, 
unity is not the ultimate goal, that principle is the ultimate goal. Boy, I've worked awfully hard to try to teach my kids, and I've got five of them, and they're all really different, that you've got to stand on principle, that you've got to know who you are in your core if you are ever going to do good or be successful in the world. But I have never suggested to my children that they should achieve, that if they can't achieve perfection, they have somehow failed. Perfection is an unworthy goal. We represent as a party a broad spectrum of ideas and principles. And we are much more open in our debate of ideas and principles than the Democrats are. But if we are ever going to govern, we have got to win elections. And if you want 1% or 12% or 80% of those principles to ever have an opportunity to be translated into policy, we have to win elections. It's, it's, it's the world we live in. And by the way, it's the process that our founding fathers very generously gave to us. So, yeah, Jennifer, yes, the but, point that's being made, though, is, I think, is if they listen to us carefully enough, the majority of people won't vote for us. Because we, we're saying that we're, we're not the party that's going to continue the flow of benefits. Mm -hmm. and, and we've told people throughout our history, vote your pocketbooks. And that used to mean vote for lower taxes. Now it means vote for your government benefits. So the, so the, the point is, is very well taken. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I took it, and the popular understanding of that report was that somehow we have to stop talking about principles and start talking about affinity politics. We like I Hispanics. Didn't. We like women. We like old people. I we like them. I, that's not what I got out of that no, report no, at all. That's, that's that's, and and that's, that's an honest answer for me. That's not what I got out of that report. When I read that report, I thought, and, 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 I, and I thought that it very much, and, and look, I didn't agree with everything in the, in the report. Like I said, it was 97 pages long. And, you know, nobody agrees with anybody about everything. But I very clearly got the message that our message is not getting through to voters. Yeah. They're yeah. not yeah. hearing the big, the big what we are about. The biggest came out of the report is we have to support amnesty, for example. So, I'm we, sorry? We have to support amnesty, for example, is what came out of the report because the defendants Hispanic that we don't. I don't Rather remember that sentence our, being in that report. Well, I've heard it from a number of so, people who citing that report so, as, as the reason. Uh, there's no question. It did talk about us having to um, revisit immigration reform. And, and so our principle always was yeah. we're the party of law and order. Right. For the party of rules. And we're saying let's we're walk away from that. For sure. we, let's walk away from that because right. that offends Hispanics and we need to vote. Right. <laughs> But, but, but I stand by what I say, and I, and I, because I feel it very strongly, and I, and I think that it's right, that we cannot, there is no such thing as a perfect candidate. There is no such thing as a perfect circumstance. But I know that the imperfection that we are living with today, with democratic leadership across the board, is something I am not willing to tolerate for my children to raise their children in. And that has to be what our priority is going forward. I want the most principled Republican we can possibly nominate, the strongest, most articulate Republican we can get. But when the day after the primary is here, I am supporting the Republican nominee. There, there, to me, there's no, you know, and I, and I respect that we don't all necessarily agree on that, but to me, there is no excuse and there's no justification for allowing another round of Democratic wins. I think probably one more question, although I can't really quite see the, I can't see the clock going by. Yes, well, sir. What's your uh, opinion on the, the drumbeat up there with third party? The drumbeat for the third party? I think I never hear the ground, and I'm hearing a lot of it, you know, and uh, it's terms of drumbeat. I think okay. it's. I, I don't hear a drumbeat for a third party. I, 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 I'm sure that you're, I'm not sure who you're talking to. Uh, I don't think. I, I, yeah, they're, um, you know, no, I, I, I reject the entire I mean, I'm, not, I, I'm a Republican Party chairman. I want you know. I think, uh, and, I, and I think that we saw there was a time when the third party would have hurt Democrats. I think in, in, in today's um, you know political environment, a third a third party would hurt Republicans. Um, I'm very much for the Republican Party and the Republican candidates. Yes, ma'am. I think that the bottom line is to get somebody in there that at least believes the same things you do, no matter what's coming out of their mouth. Because then you have a chance of at least right. reasoning with them and bringing them completely to your side. So if they say, well, you know, I might be for gay marriage or whatever, that doesn't mean that they're going to push that. Right. 
because the people in that party, in the Republican Party, are going to say, <laughs> and they're not going to do it. So once we get them in there, once we get them doing all the right things, the people in the country are going to come together on that. There's no way they can. Well, I think that instinctively we go looking for the candidate that best reflects our own personal values and principles. No question about it. I, I think the David, could you give me my water, please? I think the National GOP made a huge error last time. They didn't reach Thank out you. to some of the most popular Republicans that I know that was in office, for instance. I also think they made a huge mistake by alienating Ron Paul and his followers. Ron had an amazing grassroots campaign. I was supporting Mitt Romney the whole way. I didn't think Ron was going to right. be the one. But I think the GOP made a, made a, made a fatal error by not letting him speak at the National Convention, by alienating all of his people, and his people either didn't come out and vote or they voted for Obama. And that was the votes that Mitt needed to put him over the top. That's right. And all well, Mitt needed to do... I think we also saw in Frank New Hampshire, in the first district, um, the Libertarian vote lost it for, for Frank Anta. Right. I think, so. I think that was the fatal blow that was done by the GOP, and I think they did it, hopefully not for a reason, but I hope they, but I think they know what they were doing. Right. And here, here's my, that goes back to what I said earlier. I think that we win when we are unified, and we are unified when we are respectful of each other. And and I, and I think that that's not just. I don't say that just because um, you know I'm a chief party chair now and I want to win. You know, with elections. But the you know the other part of it is each one of those people that you just talked about had something constructive to offer to the conversation. Now I did. You know I I didn't. Uh, support Ron Paul. I didn't believe in, you know, uh, agree with him 100% or enough of a percent to be a, a, a supporter of his primary. But he had something to contribute to the conversation. He deserved to be respected. He was a major candidate. And I, and well, I think what we need to do is not dwell on the past, right. but make sure that we learn from don't it. Don't do it again. And right. going forward, it, I'll, you know, again, I, I talk to my kids about the same thing. I, I know I always use them as examples. We have got to be respectful of other people. We've got to be respectful of other ideas. Yeah. Um, and we've got to treat each other in a way that makes it possible for us to come together and work side by side when the, when the general election comes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, a thought like the, that um, we have uh, Santorum here, and he was a very good candidate, became very contentious along with Newt Gingrich. When all was said and done, Newt Gingrich stood up and backed Mitt Romney. Rick Santorum did. Uh, 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 he did everything. He, he, never came up with he, he campaigned for Mitt Romney. But, but hang on, hang on. See, this this is perfect. This is perfect. You're right. He she did. was. She was. She's on right. New Hampshire State Chair for his but, back. He tried but, to campaign for Romney. But, but hang on. You're right. He did. But, but here's my here's the point I'm trying to make. It doesn't matter. It doesn't right. matter. Well, what it's matters over. if we had more unity at that time with the right. one okay. people and we did it. Four people, religious right to make it. But we did it. So I'm, I'm done with 2012. I've been done with the November 2012 election since December 1st. It's over and it's done with. It is incumbent upon you and you and you and you and you guys to make sure it doesn't happen again. That is the task at hand. It is not. You know, it doesn't, it just, it doesn't matter. It's over, it's done, it's passed. Are we going to repeat our the same mistakes or are we going to win elections? That's, that's, the, only, right. that's the only question we no, have we, to we have, to, we have to know the mistakes were made so we don't repeat them. I agree, but don't you think we've really gone over the mistakes in pretty good detail over the past many months? I mean, in all seriousness, whether it's the, the RNC doing it or the talking heads on TV doing it, every pundit and every candidate and every activist, we all suffered tremendous genuine pain as a result of his election. We all put our hearts and souls into the campaign for the candidates that we felt so strongly about. And I respect it. And thank God you do. That's our system. That's who we are. That's that's what you know, that's what that's what America's all about. Um, but if we can't move on from it, it is going to happen again. You don't need to argue about it anymore. It doesn't matter that some Singaporean supporters came out for it and some didn't. It doesn't matter. What matters is are you going to come out for our gubernatorial candidate in November? Are you going to come out for our Senate candidate, no matter who it ends up being? That's my point. We've got to have yeah. the unity for the final I candidate. Agree. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. You've been trying to get my attention. That's all right. It, it, it jumps right off of what you're saying. Um, 
The next election is 14 months away. Um, obviously, we've learned so much. Oh my God, is it that soon? <laughs> <laughs>
you know, if you send an email to matt at nhgop.org and ask him to put you on our, um, our press list, then every time we send a press release out on something, we have another list of emails that we send it out to, activists who want to have it so they can forward it to family and friends. We'll add you to that list as well. You can have our actual press you know, press statements, uh, although they're all on the website as well at nhgp.org. I'm kind of getting very accessible. It is very accessible. And if you're running for a state right. rep seat, there's there's help. Um, in fact, Andy's wife is involved in it. There's help through the State House Representative Lori Sanborn, L-A-U-R-I-E, um, who is more than happy to help you. And through the state office, call the headquarters. If you want to run for office, call us. We want to make it as easy and as accessible for you as possible. I think a lot, a lot of it depends on how much imagination you want to put into it. My, my, my first race, I was one of seven people running for four seats, the only one who had not been involved in politics. I spent $17 of my own money because I found people to donate my cardboard, donate rolls of stamps, uh, basically everything that I needed. Out envelopes were donations to my campaign. It wasn't necessarily cash. I think. You know, the donations might have added up to about a thousand dollars, but out of my pocket I spent seven. So and, and the truth is with a couple of dollars and a tremendous amount of dedication, you can win a state rep seat by knocking on doors, handing people something that about yourself, and having a one on one conversation with every single registered Republican in your state rep district. You can win. Now listen, it's getting late. I want people have to these poor kids have to go home and go to bed. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, I had to go home and go to bed. So what I, what I, what I want to wrap up with is um, I hope that what I have been able to do is to convince you that I am all in. I am 100% in. I am giving it everything that I have. And I need you to do the same thing. I need you to be part of that team. I need you to knock on doors. I need you to make phone calls. I need you to talk to your neighbors. But I'm telling you, the work we're doing is expensive. I need you to help us pay for it. I'm not asking you to send me a couple thousand dollars. I am asking you to go home tonight, go to nhgop.org, and become a grassroots giver. It is so easy and so doable. We're asking you to give us $10 a month. That's all. Put on a credit card. We'll take it off each month. You will barely feel it. But if I could get every Republican that I talk to at all of these town and county meetings everywhere I go to become a grassroots giver, you would be paying my utility bills and my rent, and every dollar that I raise in other avenues can go toward getting Republicans elected. I need you to invest in that effort. I promise you, I am giving it 100% of what I have, and I'm asking you to please.